Okay, so we're going to be going live on Facebook and YouTube. Here we are. I think, yep. Right. Okay, I guess we're live. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And uh, really have been looking forward to this event for a while. And so is Barbara. It's a real delight to welcome our good friend, Denise Mina, or should I say Dame Denise Mina, uh, to our virtual event here today. And uh, Denise is going to be talking about her two new books, The Three Fires and The Second Murderer. And so Barbara and I are going to be kind of tag teaming the interview today. So Barbara, did you want to start off with Three Fires? I think I will, um, because I think the main thrust really ought to be talking about the Raymond Chandler. But I'm so enchanted with this book. And I love, I love Denise, the way that you write these um, kind of political books, but in a historical context. And what makes this one so much fun? I mean, basically, we're in the 1400s, 15th century Florence, but um, the prose is very modern in lots of ways. So you must have had a lot of fun um, deciding what voice to write this little tract in. And, you know, I actually, I, it was a radio program. So if you get the British one, it says, as heard on Radio 4. Ah. So it was, it was done in the voice of P.G. Woodhouse. And, uh, and it was basically that story. So it's a very serious story about the first oh. populist leader um, in sort of modern history. And, um, and I thought I could just, I could publish this as a book. And then I tried to, pub I sent it to the editor and he said, no, this isn't, this won't work on the page because so much of it was in the delivery. It was written to be read out. So I had to write another whole book. And um, so, he, you know, um, it is, is the, he was the editor for Rizzio, and uh, which was the other historical one. You and I talked about that because yeah. you're a Mary Queen of Scots um, nerd, if I can say that. Um, and he uh, said, you know, it really needs rewritten. So I got to get back into all the research and basically told it in Savonarola's voice because he's he's the most boring puritanical. He's basically a sort of prototype Puritan. And he's um, in Florence with the Medici, with Michelangelo, with Botticelli, with Da Vinci. He's the most boring man in the town. So he doesn't really very often get centered in the story, but he's an amazing man. And he did um, basically a number of miracles that no one ever talks about <laughs> apart from very, very Catholic Italians. Um, you know, he made, a, he, they were, as he, as he was being, um, killed for preaching that the Catholic Church was corrupt. He, uh, he'd been dead for an hour and they were hanging his body and his hand rose up and blessed the crowd. This is when his feet are on fire. Now, we know that it was because he was wearing a cassock and his sleeves were very wide and he basically had been fasting for months. So he's a little weedy man and his arms are withered the sleeves fill up with hot air, his hand comes up, the air goes out of the sleeve and the hand comes back down. But it still was a miracle. I mean, he's just it's just a really kind of enchanting story, but it's all true. It is all true. And, you know, you're so right that he was a populist. He was basically a human wrecking ball, like another yeah. <clears throat> current leader that we could mention here in the United States. Um, and it's interesting, um, I was talking to Brad Thor, which is a totally different kind of a book, but but part of his book is talking about an, our addiction to anger, and you mm. know I think I think that an addiction to anger is is really what you bring across so much with Savannah. I love this passage too because this is the context. Florence is full of drunks and courtesans and open sodomite marketplaces. But it is also a city of beautiful art and architecture. It's the San Francisco of its day. Tolerant, vibrant, interesting, well-run and ordered. Even the children look well-fed. It prospers. So, you know, this is the stage against which this angry, puritanical, you know, demagogue decides that he's going to wage war and he is going to feed enough anger um, mm. that he's going to be, you know, we think of him as the book burner, but it was a whole lot more than that, wasn't it? And fear. I mean, yeah. the thing about Savonarola is he was a terrible preacher, 
So he spent 10 years touring the provinces, learning how to preach. And the thing, and he watched what worked. And the thing that really worked was a certain accent. So people felt that he was one of them and making people frightened. That really, you will never go broke making people frightened. And so he tells them that, you know, um, that the world is coming to an end, that God is going to set fire to all of them, that you don't trust anybody who doesn't agree with you. And actually he's quoted, there's a Machiavelli quote at the very beginning, and it's Machiavelli says, Savonarola was a brilliant leader. Um, he managed to whip everyone up. His big mistake was he then didn't have an army to enforce his views, uh, so he couldn't sustain it, because it's all frothy emotionalism. You know, uh, there's no substance to it. And he does this really interesting thing of being astute and identifying things. He says the poor are not poor because they're lazy. They're poor because they're not paid well. They're not paid properly for the work. He says bankers are charging too much. They set up a credit union in Florence. And he segues almost immediately from those observations into, and that's why we have to kill all the Jews. <laughs> so, there's, yeah. you know, these observations that make you open up towards them and then suddenly he suggests a course of action that is irrelevant to the point that he's observed. You see Modi doing that in India. You see Erdogan. You see, um, you know, all these populists, Boris Johnson. It's the same the world over. It's always the same act, you know. Um, and I was just struck by the parallels. I mean, it's, it's staggering. It's a very old act. Works every time. Well, it really is. And yet, you know, you also point out that some of, you know, Martin Luther's theses were rooted in a few points that Savonarola makes. For example, the intervention of priests isn't necessary to reach God. God speaks straight to his people. But then, of course, you know, the demagogue will will make himself, you know, that channel in which God is speaking yeah. to the people. And, you know, it's a way of using faith, you know, um, to reinforce whatever it all is. And, you know, we see the Christian evangelicals in America, you know, are such a um, part of our current divisiveness and so forth. And part of that is by, you know, calling on faith, ignoring science in favor of faith, um, you know, that kind of thing. I just thought your book's actually quite funny in places. Um, I love the voice, but I thought it's a very serious subject. And it's all done in like a hundred and what thirty four books or thirty four pages or something, but I think I think this is a really powerful story, historically true, but incredibly relevant today. Um, and you know, those of us who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Although it seems to me that there are always enough people that don't know history that we always wind up in a recycle, right? Yeah, and I think also some people who do know history get tips from it, Barbara, so, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I mean, sometimes people are looking at people like Savonarola and they're thinking, oh, that's how you do it. Okay, so you need a uniform, uh, you know, God speaks directly to the people, but then you change who the people are. The people are only men. He didn't want to talk to women. He didn't want any birth control. He didn't want to talk to Jews. He thought we should just kill all gays. Um, and interestingly, as soon as he introduced that, no one made a complaint about anyone being gay in Florence. <laughs> Nobody. And it's just the whole city said, yeah, that's absolutely right. It is dreadful. But that's their cousin and their brother and their father, and, you know, maybe their husband. And, you know, in a very small, it's really interesting, the, the um, equal marriage thing in Ireland. The reason it changed was because mothers who had gay sons and gay nephews all voted for it against the wishes of the church. So it is that filial connection really protects people sometimes, you know? Um, and uh, um, anyway, I forgot what I was talking about, but, but he's, just, he's just such an amazing character, Savonarola. As, he was an amazing person. And, I, and the thing is, I disagree with him fundamentally, but I do think he was sincere. And you can't but love somebody who's sincere, you know? Whereas, I mean, I think Donald Trump, I don't even think he's genuinely racist. I just think he just thinks that will sell, you know? Yeah. Um, I, think yeah. He's, I think he's a human wrecking ball. And, you know, whatever it yeah. takes to accomplish that um, is what he's willing to do. He's a, he's a huckster and a hustler, yeah. you know, and a grifter, which is an entirely different thing than somebody who is, you know, rooted in um, 
in belief and in sincerity. So we'll mm -hmm. see, you know, we'll see. I think, you know, looking at Putin, you have to think that he actually does believe that Russia should restore its empire and, you know, should be an imperial power. Whether he's right, you know, or wrong isn't really the question, but I think he actually does believe it. So there we are. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about, but I, I can't tell you how much I like this book. And I think, oh, that's I think everybody should you. read it because it's very thought provoking, as well as, as I said, the dialogue is so great. I hadn't even thought of Woodhouse, but you're right. There, <laughs> there is a, a Woodhousey in nature to Denise's comments about how it all goes. So besides, you could learn some history. Not a bad thing. All right, Patrick, over to you, because I have not read The Second Murderer to My Sorrow, so I'm going to listen to what you have to say. Well, Denise, I absolutely loved it. Um, oh, I'm always, I'm always uh, as as maybe you are too, um, I'm always a little dubious about you know people trying to do something like this. And you know we've yeah. all read various examples of it where it just... Uh, it just didn't, you know, they made the good effort, but it just didn't really capture what made Chandler Chandler, I guess, you know, and so I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit about that. I mean, um, and boy, you really get it, you know, fr from my perspective, um, everything, all the, all those unique uh, attributes about Chandler that we can get into to talk about, but um, it just occurred to me, a uh, the, the, the number three and then the second murderer. And so maybe we could start by talking about the significance of the title. And it comes from yeah. Richard III, right? Yeah, it's actually in Farewell, My Lovely. Is it? And uh, yeah, it is. He talks about the second murderer, that scene in Richard III. And he says, um, you know, there's a theme where there's a murderer and he's reluctant to do the murder, but he really wants the money. So he kind of hesitates. And, it, and, and somebody gave me a first edition copy of Raymond Chandler's notebooks. And one of the things was a list of possible titles. And the, one of the possible titles was The Second Murderer. Really? So, wow. yeah, so, so that's where it comes from. So you can nerd out because, uh, I mean, I really, I love research, as you know, and, uh, and I went quite deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, let's just talk about how, how did you get the gig in the first place? And... Um, how did you approach? Did you go back and read all the books? Did you just immerse yourself in that in the voice? And um, what an interesting process it is because I'm very wary when people get an estate gig. I thought, I think like everyone else, that what happens is they offer you a huge amount of money. That's not what happens. What they say is, do you love this writer? And you say, I love Chandler. And they say, would you like to try and write a Chandler book? So then you have to come up with some sample chapters to see if you've got the voice and um, an outline. And you send that to the estate. Right. And the estate is a board of people. So the book is about someone's artistic estate, because I, I think that's so interesting. And they're amazing people. They're so interesting. And I, I spoke to them. I had a Zoom meeting with them and I said, look, I would love to do this. But um, I'm so interested in what you're all doing here. Can I interview all of you? So they let me interview all of them about how they came to be doing this job and, um, you know, what their interest was in it and what their experience of Chandler was. Some of them were personal, some of them were filial, some of them were, you know, they just were on boards and loads of things. But they were so open about it. It was lovely. Anyway, so then they said, right, OK, we want you to do it. Then you take it to a publisher and the publisher says, we want to publish this. And then the estate gets some of the money. So you're actually paying to do the job. It's very interesting. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that is a really, it's not what I thought it was at all. But um, I love Raymond Chandler and I've always loved Raymond Chandler and I love his early writing. Now, I think he, you know, we know so much more about the progression of alcoholism now, but I think he descended into alcoholism and you can really see that in his later writing. He becomes quite bitter. He's very racist. He's very misogynistic. Um, and... Uh, but the early one where he's where the voice is self-depreciating and he has some sense of perspective and he's in love with the city and he is a broken hearted romantic, really, Marlowe. Um, and I mean, he's he's because when you're doing something like that, you're thinking, am I am I cosplaying Chandler? Am I, 
you know, am I LARPing Marlo? What, 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 what is the job to do here? You know, how could I make someone like me who loves Chandler enjoy this? What, what, what are the things that I really love about it? But then the more research I did, the more I realized he was doing Dash O'Hammett. And, and Dash O'Hammett was writing in the house style of the Pinkerton Agency, you know, whereas the, the Pinkerton Agency reports, they were told no adjectives, uh, no adverbs, just facts, short, concise sentences. So it goes back and back and back. But anyway, so what I did was I read all the Chandler books again in order, and then I listened to them on audiobook as well to get the voice and um, and worked out the things that I really loved about them. I loved the aphorisms, mm -hmm. you know, the metaphors, the love of language. Uh, you know, I really loved that people will recommend a, a Chandler book to you by saying there's this line in it. I think that's magical, you know. Uh, people don't say it's a great plot and you really find out what happens. Nobody ever says that but Chandler because they're just <laughs> nonsense. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. But people really love the writing and that is, you know, that's such a magical thing. And uh, do you know that he was at the same school as P.G. Woodhouse? No. Yeah, they missed each other by a term. They both went to Dulwich College in South London and they had the same English masters. I'll be darned. And they both use aphorisms like that. So P.G. Woodhouse says things like, I legged it like a nymph surprised while bathing. And Marlowe says all the stuff he says or Chandler says all the stuff he said. So, so I think they were taught by the same people and they learned the same basic style. So it's the same basic style, but going off in two very different directions, you know? Um, but stylistically, they're very similar, I think. But anyway, anyway, I did too much research. I think you can tell that. But <laughs> so, uh, so then I worked out, okay, so you want a story that romps along in this lovely world with this character at the start of his career when he still believes in love and justice and he's a truth teller. And actually the, um, uh, the oh, what's his name? Elliot Gold, um, right. um, The Big Sleep. What, who, who did that film? It was, it was written long, by- It was The Long Goodbye. The Long Goodbye. And it was written by- Altman. What's the name of the- Altman. And, and what's, what's brilliant about that book, and my agent Henry Durnow actually pointed it out was, He's a man with his own value system living in a world that doesn't chime with that value system. And I, and I took that as a kind of style headline was that he was a, a man going down a lonely road. That man must go alone. And he's the only person who has that value system. But he's trying to live by that in a world that's quite hostile to it. You know, I think right. a lot of people feel that way. I think that's one of the things people love about Marlowe is mm -hmm. that, you know, he there are things he won't do. And it's very clear from the beginning. Yeah. yeah, he you know, and he had that, you know, the whole the simple art of murder that you just kind of quoted from and the uh, the code. Um, but also it, I like how you you set, you know, you set the book in, in Los Angeles. And it seems to me, I don't know if you agree with this, but do you think that um Chandler's Marlowe belongs to a specific time and place? I do. I think he belongs to 1937 to 1952, maybe tops, absolute tops. But I think even 52, because the thing is, LA changed so fundamentally around just before and after the war, because there was money flooding down from the mob in Chicago and it corrupted everything. So everything became really decayed and, and it was kind of um it was the end of a really hopeful time I think when when fractures started happening then there were the anti-hispanic race riots right. um you know uh, then you know the, the social divisions the kind of race divisions really started that, that was kind of imported from the rest of America but that was a kind of magical period um when you know I mean it's funny being Scottish and writing a book set in LA but actually I'm no further from that LA than people who live in LA now are you know you can see you can't even see the footprint of it you can see sunset there are little ghosts, you can see, there are little yeah, ghosts coming up you know you know are, yeah. let me just add that the war brought an absolutely gigantic influx of people to California the war in the Pacific and it truly changed Southern California Los Angeles, San Diego and so forth my father who actually was you know alive then remembers 
going to Los Angeles before the war and how beautiful it was, but how rural it was. You know, there yeah. were all and and how dramatically it changed in the 50s when the war was over and all those people who'd come out there to work in defense, all that defense money and so forth, it completely changed it. And, you know, the geology of California is not really suited to this much population. It's 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 largely mud, you know, and um, yeah. people, you know, built unsuitable houses and, you know, cities on treacherous land. That's why they're always having earthquakes and fires and so forth. I mean, California, I went to California to college in 1958 when it was still kind of everybody's dream, the golden land, you know, one reason I went to Stanford. And it's not there anymore. Today, it's actually, you know, like a nightmare more than it is a golden, a golden place. But Chandler was there before the war. And I think yeah. that was his Los Angeles. And he you know, the transformation of it was part of, along with the alcoholism, um, I'm sure soured him. To well, also, the, a, also the, the rise of the interstates, you know, really. Yeah. You know, demolished places like Bunker Hill, which you talk about in the book a little bit. Yeah. We can, we can see it coming, you know. Denise, have you read um, your fellow Scott, Robin Robertson's long book length poem about uh noir and los angeles um, no i haven't it's really I know Robin. it's really something um i wrote a piece about it for the uh la review of books when it came out and um he you know and i like how you you have skid row in this book i don't i don't want to give any spoilers away but the location you know robin talks a lot about how you know the skid row at that time post-war was full of veterans um, most mm -hmm. of them minority veterans, you know, down on their luck, who kind of been chewed up and spit out by the system. Really, really interesting. Um, and he talks a lot about Bunker Hill and sort of Dan Fonte's Bunker Hill, um, that whole period. Um, oh, I must read that. He's a brilliant poet. I love his work. I can't remember that. It's the long something, the long fall or something like that. Do you yeah. know, I think somebody told me about it while I was writing the book and I didn't read it because I didn't want to steal his voice. Yeah, it's really So I good. think I have, a, I have it written down somewhere. It's about a shell-shocked shell soldier who comes back and uh, ends up in Los Angeles. And that's all I'll say, but it's you, you'd love it. Yeah, but there's, um, there's lots of footage of LA at that time. And what they did was they got one of these giant old cars and they put a camera in it and they drive around Bunker Hill and uh, they drive around LA. And like you're saying, Barbara, so much of it is rural. There are all these dusty patches and, you know, on what would be prime sites now. And then you can kind of see like a sort of new town in the background. Um, and, but it is just such a different place. Yeah, it really is. It'll be interesting to see what the writer's strike does. You know, one of the things that I have wondered about, you were just talking about cancel culture in this book, Savannah Rolla, a master of cancel culture. And, you know, much of Chandler, especially later Chandler, is really offensive to um, mm -hmm. a lot of modern readers, you know, when you get into sensitivity and all. Um, but yet, I don't think that one should change a word of it because, you know, it's authentic to who he was and when he wrote. So how did you deal with that? How did you deal with, I mean, I don't know since I've read the book, but how did you deal with his, you know, the terminology that he used, which was fairly common then, but would be considered horrendous now. Well, I wanted to, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was because I wanted to write a corrective for that, because I think Marlowe is a character. I think that was Chandler. I don't think that's Marlowe as a character mm. from the Marlowe of the early books. So I got the chance to um, have female characters from other books appear and Reardon appears. And um, I don't know if you remember Anne Reardon, she's in Farewell, My Lovely, and she wants to be, she saves Chandler, she saves Marlowe's life several times, well, certainly one time. And uh, her, her, she's a brilliant character, you're always thirsting for more of her. And I got to bring her back and she has a job and uh, she has a business in this one. She's got ambitions beyond just getting a boyfriend, as um, some women do, unbelievably. And... Um, 
uh, I got to take him to the, the gay scene in LA at that time, which was, you know, really thriving. Apparently there isn't a lesbian bar in LA now. And somebody was doing a report at Pride last year. Uh, but at that time, the, the gay scene had loads and loads of cabarets. They had to be very careful who they let in. You know, they had bouncers on the door, but it was really thriving and very unseen. So I got to take him into lots of places that Chandler wouldn't have taken Marlow and have him not be a bigot, uh, which I think, you know, is, you know, he's, I mean, he's still the man he is. He's still quite a kind of a man of narrow experience. But um, uh, there's, there's quite a famous Glasgow character called Jimmy the One who appears in this book. And Jimmy the One was an out gay guy in Glasgow in the early 70s. And he did outreach work to prisons. He was just himself. He was an incredibly dignified, well-respected man. But he was known as Jimmy the One because he was the one out gay guy in Glasgow. And I got to put, and, and he loved the movies. And I got to put him in this book, <clears throat> in this book as a very good looking um, gay guy in LA that people keep trying to make a movie star. I was thinking about John Wayne actually, how beautiful he was. Um, and uh, people keep trying to put Jimmy the one in movies and he keeps turning up with a boyfriend or being found in the wrong bar. And um, so, so really what I wanted to do was write the Marlowe that I wanted to read with Chandler's voice and have him be, have an experience of going to Hispanic bars, you know, not being racist. And uh, I don't know, you know, he did have a lot of respect for Spanish speakers. I have to say he did all the way through the books. And, um, you know, he corrects other characters when they um, laugh at people for speaking Spanish. Um, you know, so there was a glimmer of, you know, decency there. Um, so it's a kind of corrective for me. Um, and the particularly the female characters, I think. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Manny Perez, who I thought was one of the key characters in the book. And some of those scenes with them, Marlo and Manny together are just magical. Yeah, Matt, so Manny is, uh, uh, this is a very familiar thing if you're from a Catholic background. He's a Hispanic uh, man who has married an Irish woman they met at chapel, right? And uh, she has a horror of drink because she's Irish. So of course she marries an alcoholic, Manny's an alcoholic. And um, and of she just can't go with it. <laughs> Yeah, of the hopeless variety. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Poor Manny. Anyway, um, but because Marlo has a is a drinker, he knows what's going to happen to Manny, who's refusing to tell him something when he blacks out, and he tricks him into giving very important information. But they go from uh, a, a dive bar to a bar that's beyond the dive. I mean, it's a deep sea bar that has uh, like a mud floor and a ladder to get down. And the heat, Manny gets chucked out because he's so badly behaved in that bar. And, um, uh, you know, he's just like a working stiff who wouldn't live long. You know, the, these people are lost in history. They're just going to melt into the background. Even their families forget them because it's shameful. And, uh, and I just wanted to honor that guy because, you know, the world's built on those people. And I like the little detail how you have him. I think I think you have him from uh, Chavez Ravine, you know, which is a fascinating little tidbit of L.A. lore. Yeah. You know, before yeah. Dodger Stadium came in, it was uh, you no know, very vibrant barrio. And uh, yeah, it was an amazing. It was an amazing village. I mean, it was a town really, and you know, it had its own culture. It had dances. Uh, you know, there were dressmakers there. It was an amazing place. And they just uh, cut the top off it, moved everybody out, and built Dodger Stadium. And as you're saying, they built the freeway around there and basically sliced up the city. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not that was political. Um, in Scotland, in Glasgow, after the war, they built the freeway in a circle around the centre of Glasgow because they said, if there's going to be a communist revolution anywhere in Britain, it's going to be Glasgow. And we can put tanks all around the city and we can stop people, um, we, can, well, we can kill them, <laughs> wow. you know, so that felt very familiar, yeah. That was, I think it was um, in a cabinet just after the war, he decided to build that. Robert Moses did that to New York, you know, with the with the roads that he, the free expressways and so forth, and it definitely cuts off communities mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. There, there are a bunch of tons of 
quotable passages yeah. that are very Chandler-esque. And there's one that I just, you mentioned the bar that he goes into, and I, I actually marked this. Um, uh, I stepped in the I stepped in the back door of Hank's. The floor was sticky, the clientele rough, and the beer cold. Whoever Hank was, he thought of everything. They had drink and stools and kept the front and back doors propped open for a cross breeze. I sm it smelled of beer and stale cigarettes. I had found heaven. <laughs> Very Chandler asking. <-esque. laughs> no adverbs, right? And hardly. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So just briefly, I mean, we don't want to give away any spoilers, but um, can you talk just about the basic the basic plot? You know, there's a there's a general Sternwood Sternwood type character at the beginning of the book. Um, you know, who says uh, Mr. Chadwick Montgomery Esquire? Uh, talk about the that story. So, uh, so it starts off with him worrying that he's missed something in a previous case that was. Uh, um, a cowboy who was murdered, like one of these old cowboys that used to hang about this particular bar. And uh, he's, kind of, he's kind of fretting about that. And the call comes through and he doesn't like the tone of the woman on the voice, or, or the woman's voice. She's quite haughty. And uh, then he finds out why she's haughty. And it's because she's calling from uh, Montgomery's mansion. And would, she, would he like to go up there? And uh, so he switches very quickly from get off the phone to I'll be there in a minute. And, uh, and he gets up there. Chadwick has lost his daughter and he doesn't really want her back. But his daughter has a kid. And he ha he, when the kid grows up, he needs to be able to say to him, we tried looking for your mother when she disappeared. Um, so they employ, they employ Marlo because they think Marlo won't find her. Um, and they offer him a lot of money, too much money, suspicious amount of money. And Marlo says, no, I only work for my rates because then you know, I keep my integrity and uh, they think he's a clown. Anyway, he almost immediately finds her. I think he said, I think I said uh, she was easier to find than an optimist in the casino. And, uh, uh, and it turns out that she's, um, she has deliberately disappeared and she wants to build another life. And she's working in a, an art gallery and uh, the gallery is run by basically, it's owned by basically Peggy Guggenheim, right? So what um, she's brought, she's gone to she's gone to Europe at the start of the war. She's bought up entire studios of these artists. She's bringing them over to America. She's building up their reputation. She's selling their work for loads and loads of money. And this is the world she wants to be in. Now, why she wants to be in there, I won't do a spoiler, but um, he is trying to, he's sort of keeping an eye on her. He doesn't really know what the score is. And he follows her down to a hotel on Skid Row that she shouldn't really be in. And she's in the room when someone is murdered. Um, and he runs up, helps her get out. And then he has to try and work out what's actually going on and, and who has enticed her out of this mansion to come to places like Skid Row and witness murders. And what's the benefit of her witnessing this murder? Right. Um, now, you mentioned Anne Riordan. Is it Riordan or Riordan? How do you, how would you pronounce it? Riordan. 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 Anne Riordan. Yeah. Um, I love this. Uh, there's a quote, you know, she makes reference to the fact that she originally wanted to work for Marlowe. Um, he doesn't trust a dame to do the job. <laughs> that does yes. nice double duty, doesn't it, with uh, you taking on the project? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know I'm not really a dame? No. Yeah, no, I fraudulently claim to have a damehood because I don't agree with the honor system. <laughs> but <laughs> but every so well, often I'm on the news and it says Dame Denise Minor because journalists well, think it's hilarious. We'll and it was a lot going. funnier when I was 40. But now it looks as if I could actually be a dame and people give me a hard time on social media for accepting a dame. <laughs> I don't really know what to do about it. Um, do you have uh, do you have a favorite of, of Chandler's work? You know, I think uh, The Long Goodbye I think it's the best plotted. And I think it deals with that kind of uh -oh. we've lost her briefly here. Yeah, pregnant pause here. She did say that her internet was rubbish in the evening. I don't yeah. know. She should um maybe you should 
black her out and bring her back in. Let's see. I think it's a really beautifully written book and I didn't see where it was going to work out quite what was going on. Uh-oh, there you are. We lost you, you there for, we lost oh, you you? for a moment. Yeah. Sorry about that. No worries. I said something startlingly insightful. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were saying talking about the long goodbye and um and then you kind of froze. So you oh, said his best plotted book, but yeah, and also it deals with something that I have never really read about before, which is like a really beguiling friend who's a bit toxic and how loyal he is. I mean, it really, it just puts, just the whole thing of him being hopelessly loyal to someone who doesn't deserve it, I think is quite lovely. Do you have a favourite? What's your favourite? It's a toughie. I mean, I, I really like Farewell, My Lovely. Um, yeah. And I do, I do like the long goodbye, you know, although you do get a sense that he put a, like everything but the kitchen sink in there, you know. Yeah. Um, but I was going to ask you about, see, my favorite film version of Chandler is the Farewell, My Lovely with Mitchum, Robert Mitchum from the 70s. Have you seen that one? Do you know, I haven't seen it. And the reason I haven't seen it is because of the age differential between him and the girl. And that's, that's on the poster, and it's like, it just looks like a creepy dad stealing his. So I don't. It just creeps me out. Is it very good? I, I love Mitchum. It was great, yeah. And Charlotte Rampling is in it, and she's fantastic. Uh, good cast. Harry Dean Stanton. Mm. But uh, very good. Yeah. Is he immortal? Yeah. Is he immortal? He's Harry been around Dean forever. Yeah. I know. Well, he passed away finally a couple of years ago. Well, uh, that's a rumor. A uh, rumor, yeah, <laughs> right. Now, what's your? How do you feel about um, about Hammett? Because a lot of writers either seem to be Hammett or Chandler or or both. What do you think? I'm both. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I really am both, and I, I you know, I mean, I can see, um, you know, I can see the. I can see why people find Chandler more accessible now because Hammett wrote in such a particular way. Uh, but I think it's like, uh, you know, neither of those two guys would give us stuff, whether, you know, a kind of post-punk from Glasgow woman liked their stuff. So I feel like I can just, I don't have to take a side. <laughs> they didn't have a lot of respect for women. I actually wrote an introduction to um, The Thin Man, the relaunch of The Thin Man. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a real pleasure to do, actually. Yeah, I'd forgotten how much I loved them because I read them so long ago. And people don't talk about them so much, you know? Yeah. Yeah, That's he doesn't true. seem to have that kind of currency, you know? I think his language is so spare that many people just don't bond to it. I, I was never able to read Red Harvest, for example. And I did, a, I did an informal poll once when we were gathered. Patrick, I think you were there at the Orpheum to talk about the thin man. I don't even remember why, but anyway, there I was leading the discussion. And I, I asked for a show of hands about how many people had read the thin man as opposed to watching the film with Bacall. And, and most people knew it only from the film. They had never yeah. actually read it. Um, and, you know, I, th I think Chandler's prose is so richer whether you believe, you know, whether you like that or not, I think that's why more people bond to him because, you know, I mean, you can hardly beat a phrase like, you know, last night when the Hakaranda trees were in bloom. I'm quoting Michael Conley because that was the line that he liked when we talked about Chandler. But, you know, his imagery is really beautiful. Yeah. And he paints a scene. That's yeah. something Hammett doesn't really do. You know, he doesn't tell you what the furniture is. Um, but The Thin Man was such a seminal book for crime yeah. fiction. It is a cross between noir and a cosy. It is an amazing book. It has puzzle elements and it has noir. and it ha Because a drinking couple living in a hotel, friends with people from different social strata, was outrageous then. Um, but you know, the, you know the central uh, thing about The Thin Man is... Um, that uh, he they find a body and the body is wearing fat man clothes, so they assume it's a fat man. 
And it turns out it was actually a thin man who was murdered. And that's like the central thing. I've ruined that for everybody now. But um, apparently that was inspired because he was living at the Pierre and had run up a massive bill and um, couldn't afford to pay it. So he put all his clothes on and snuck out of the Pierre and went to a cheaper hotel. And that's where the idea from the thin man came from, which is, is that the right? best wow. origins in that great origin story. That's fantastic. I mean, that's where heart that's where heart to heart comes from. That's where any husband and wife duo um crime fix, crime busters comes from, is from the thin man, you know? It's so seminal. We don't talk about it because it was very commercially successful, I think. Maybe so. Yeah. Have you read you know, just I read just a couple of years ago, The Dane Curse, which uh, I'd never read before. And it was no, I haven't read that. It's such a bizarre and interesting book. Um, really liked it a lot. Uh, I should check it out. Yeah. I wonder why it is that both of them were alcoholics. You know, I, I'm not sure what kind of comment that is that both Hammett and Chandler, you know, just drink was, you know, maybe their muse and certainly their undoing. So, well, you know, Hammett should have written so much more than he did. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and uh, and the reason he didn't was was because of the drink. And Chandler was so profoundly unhappy. Um, I mean, it's, tra you know, when you read his later letters, they're really heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, um, ugh, it's just awful sad. I, you just think, what, we, what, what did we lose because of that, you know, because of that illness, you know? Yeah, I was actually I was going to bring that up, comparing their their letters, because I think you know Chandler's letters are almost as interesting as the novels. You know, I mean, he just bleeds all over the page, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think he's quite drunk when he's writing letters. He's because... very disinhibited. Yeah, he's very disinhibited in a way that's you know his language in the letters is amazing. I mean, he's not putting it on for the books. He's not assuming. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I remember I, I knew a crime writer and he used to wear a hat to write and uh, because he was assuming a persona. And um, I don't think he got published after his first book. But, uh, uh, but you know, he that was who he was 24-7. He was always clipping words together. And he took real joy in that. Do you, do you feel that from his letters? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I need to go back and revisit those. Yeah, whereas, you know, Hammett's letters are, are, as you would imagine, very clipped and not terribly revealing. Mm. But, um, yeah. Did you know that Pinkerton came from Glasgow? No. He came from Glasgow and he was, uh, he left Glasgow because he was a chartist and thought everyone should have the boat and he couldn't get any work. So he left and went to America. Really? That's very cool. Yeah. Wow. And became very, very right wing. And actually, you know, they were shooting at trade unionists in the steel mills, owned by Carnegie and Frick. And almost as soon as they mowed down all these uh, striking workers, Carnegie refused ever to see Frick again and started his foundation and gave away a whole lot of money, whitewashing his um, his uh, reputation. That's so every time you're in those libraries. Do you know what I mean? Swings and roundabouts, you know, lots of dead workers, a lovely hall. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, well, if, if you know, every every great fortune is built on a great crime, um, then you can see <laughs> that, you know, people want to whitewash. Look at Rockefeller. I mean, you know, he was a pirate beyond pirates, crushed lives, ruined lives, the whole bit. And then, you know, it's like, you know, Bill Gates turning into a philanthropist or God knows what Elon Musk might decide to do one day. I don't know. I keep hoping he's going to sort of just dissolve into X. I love the fact that San Francisco made them take down the X sign today. <laughs> Yay. Good from them. <laughs> I know. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we can sit here and talk about Chandler and Hammond and all of that, but, you know, it'd be, it'd be fun if we could live another 50 years and then talk about you know, writers of today or things of today, it's always easier to look back and understand what's going on than it is yeah. figure it out while it's actually happening. Yeah, yeah. And right. they'll look back and they'll say, if she wasn't so addicted to hot yoga, she could have written so much more. <laughs> <laughs> if she didn't have all those dogs, how much TikTok. more could she have got done? 
Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I think it's fascinating how many people have written a Chandler from Robert Parker to uh, didn't John Banville write a Chandler? Don't John Banville, Joe, Joe, uh, Joe, yeah. 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 Joe, oh, Joe Ede. Oh, Joe Ede just just has written E Day too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, he so there is doing a contemporary thing. You know, there is really something compelling. And of course, uh, for those of you who don't know this, you know, it, a writer's estate, if there is one, has to actually authorize stuff like that. Or, you know, um, and not every not every dead author has a literary estate. So I'm always yeah. counseling authors when they come to the store to give real thought to a literary estate because if you don't. Um, you don't have, you know, there are many bad things that can happen if you have the kind of literary output that somebody might want to continue. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't think about that. You know, creative people yeah. don't necessarily go in that direction, but it's really worth a thought. But in the case of Chandler, there is an estate. I think there's a Hammond estate too, if I'm not, but I'm not entirely sure. There certainly is a Conan Doyle estate, which is a thorn on everybody's side for years. Um, yeah, but the, I mean, the, the Hammett, the problem with Hammett is Hammett was charged with and found guilty in a civil court of rape. So that is the problem with Hammett is nobody wants to touch it because it is a bag of poison. Um, wow. Yeah, so and it wasn't even I mean, this was like, I think, in the 30s, which when it was almost impossible to get a, a conviction. So although he was, um, you know, he had a great kind of political, he was a political activist. You know, he was persecuted. He refused to give names. I mean, he was really a really honourable man. There, are, there's a lot of dark stuff there as well. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Which you know, to get a conviction, well, to get a case against you and have to pay somebody damages after a finding of the court, yeah, was a big deal in those. I mean, it was very clear what had happened. Um, and uh, but, I mean, I think if you really want to live on after your death, you have to have a lot of children who are unemployable and you need an estate. That's really what you need. You need <laughs> children who need to live off your work. And, uh, you know, um, that really is how to, to, to live on, I think. That's the way to do it. I'm too late. Oh, is this a one off thing for you, Denise? You know, you've written your Chandler and, and that's it. Do you know, I would love to do another one. I really would. I would love to do another one. I'm so interested in um, people passing for white. And, you know, um, I, I in L.A. at that time, and I grew up in Paris where racial uh, divides were very different. So, yeah. you know, people of African origin in Paris were really not, um, uh, there wasn't a lot of prejudice against people. Algerians, you couldn't get a job or housing. But, you know, I thought it would be very interesting for somebody from that background to go to LA and try to navigate the racial divides there. Because obviously, you know, as a white person, you can't really, I don't think, you know, you can properly represent the experience of African-Americans. But I thought, you know, um, you know, a black Parisian, you probably could um, uh, talk about that. And I think that's really interesting because one of the things about Chandler is he goes into all these unseen worlds and that's what's so beautiful about him. So going into the gay scene and going into, you know, you know, kind of that sort of racial divide, I think that would be fascinating and how he uncovers the truth in these different worlds, these interlocking worlds that LA was at that time. So we'll see anyway. How about how about an Anne Reardon novel? <laughs> I know you could have a whole series of Anne Reardon. Yeah, you could She's just amazing. remove Marlowe entirely just from her, her and her agency. He could just turn up sometimes and save her from a dope fiend or something. Right. Um, uh, but she, so she has a lady detective agency and um, and she's deciding in this book whether or not she's going to make the kind of moral compromises that anyone who sets up a business has to make. Is she going to deal with, you know, she's dealing with mob money, but at the same time, they're less corrupt than the politicians that she's, <laughs> she's strong arming. And um, she's setting up a spy network of cigarette girls um, who are like the unseen ears um, all around LA. So they know everything that's going on and nobody thinks they can hear because they've got good legs. So, I mean, I think that would be great. You know, I think she's um, she's so cool, Anne Reardon. She's got her own house. She dresses really well. You know, she's uh, her dad was a cop who was run off the force by cor corrupt cops. She knows the score. She's a writer. 
Um, she, you know, she writes for magazines and she has a car and a gun. She's so cool. <laughs> and of course, L.A. was, you know, thick with Germans at that time, you know, especially Hollywood. Lots of uh, lots yeah. of Germans there. Yeah. 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 Well, there's, 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 look at questions. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Mainly just comments. Um, my grandfather introduced me to Chandler when I was a teenager and I fell in love with his work, says Susan. Um, someone's pointing out a podcast about the Maltese Falcon recently and about the oh. whole. Yeah. So that's going to be in the comments if you want to check that out. Oh, great. Um, let's see. Let me check, uh, check YouTube. Mainly just people are very interested and want to read the book. Wonderful. Well, that's kind questions. of what we're here for. That's I would good. like to recommend, if you're a Chandler fan, you haven't seen it, that you find the director's cut DVD of The Big Sleep because, um, you know, it's a movie, again, like The Thin Men. Many people think they know Chandler from the movie. But if you if you see it with the director's cut, you will see that in the interest of promoting Lauren Bacall, two or three scenes that were actually critical to the plot got cut out of the movie as we saw it. And it's really interesting to see it as it would have been had they left those scenes in. I was completely enthralled by it. And Does it make sense more? Yes, the one, the actual pivotal scene where the plot makes sense is the one that got cut off so Lauren Bacall got more <laughs> this time. Seriously, I mean, I was really? just blown away by it. And I, I just can't recommend enough because, you know, there, there's such a thing about translating, you know, literature, literary, stories into in, into film and it's a classic example of how you know the exigencies of the movies and casting and all the rest of it can change a story almost unrecognizably uh, for people and yet many people think that the big sleep is the book i thought the film didn't make sense because they couldn't mention pornography or drugs now you which should is what it's about I am the director's cut and you will see that yes. there's a whole scene in the, I think the DA's office so that hit the floor because <laughs> um, they wanted to give Lauren Bacall more face time. And, um, and that's the scene where the plot actually makes sense. I have a, I have a quick <laughs> question for you, Denise, maybe, maybe a final one, which is um, just about, about the language and, and the editing process. Um, did you ever have, did you, what was the what was that like in rewriting the book? Did you find any um, Scottishisms or little subtle turns of phrase that weren't American sneaking in that your editor caught? Did I though? I mean, I think there were words that I got wrong. Um, I can't think what they were. One of the difficulties is no one says hi and no one says yeah. <clears throat> and you realize how, yes, people don't say that yet. They say sure, and people don't say okay. And you realize how, you know, those shortened versions of things, you really kind of come to rely on them. Um, but I don't think, I mean, I very often get words wrong. So I would say curtains or, you know, um, oh, what else would I say? I don't know. Something about clothes. It was quite hard to get the right terminology for clothes because, um, you know, like, certain types of pants or certain types of suits would be called one thing in LA and a different thing in New York. Um, and, you know, getting things like that right. I actually wanted to come out to LA and drive an Oldsmobile because in James M. Cain, the car makes such a difference to the plot in The Postman Only Rings Twice. And I thought it'd be great to have something about how these old cars actually operated, you know. Uh, but I never got the chance to do that because of lockdown. But um, I can't really remember the editing process. Um, but it wasn't that extensive, I don't think. Yeah. You know? Once you got into the voice, it, did it just feel very natural? Yeah, it did. I actually felt like going to visit an old friend every day when I sat down at the desk. It was, I mean, it's such an act of love, do you know what I mean? Because I love his work so much. And, uh, and I know a lot of people don't read his work because they pick up the wrong book and they're like this is just racist rubbish <laughs> you know or all the women are trying to kiss him for all the time for no it's never really explained why I have a feeling that Chandler read James Bond 
and got slightly poisoned by those books. So he becomes kind of the, the ultimate man at some point, Marlowe, in the stories. And he's right about everything and he's quite humorless and everyone fancies him. Um, which, I mean, I don't know if you've read all the Bond books, but they're awful. They're, they're awful. I don't, <laughs> I mean, I don't know why these films are still being made. They're dreadful. And, uh, and I think he was slightly poisoned by it. I don't think he knew why people loved his work so much. Have you heard that BBC interview when uh, Chandler came to the UK and interviewed Fleming? No, I haven't, because I know it's he's pretty, wasted in it. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. And you can is it? Hear, is it? You can, you can hear them smoking. <laughs> throughout right. The whole, <laughs> you know, um, no, but it's, it's interesting how Fleming kind of defers to Chandler in the interview. Right. Yeah, yeah, Ooh. worth checking out. Well, what's next for you, Denise? What are you working on at the moment? I'm working on a book about a forensic scientist who realizes that her discipline is junk science, which I think is fascinating. Um, every generation has science that seems absolutely set in stone and every generation discovers that this is absolute rubbish. Forensic odontology, bite marks, Rubbish. I studied it at a university. Apparently it's absolute rubbish. It's the only reason Ted Bundy was convicted. Bite marks. Blood spatter, as we all know from the staircase. Really not that much of a science. You know, it's kind of good guessing, really. Um, so I just I thought that would be fascinating and how that could, you know, how difficult it gets when you're older and you're really invested in things staying the same to participate in change. And I was really thinking about climate change, you know. And uh, I notice myself becoming comfortable and, you know, having a car and justifying it. And, you know, I notice myself, uh, you know, trying not to think about climate change or about how uh, people who have nothing. And when I was young, I said to myself, I will never forget what this is like. And I will not be one of those oblivious older people. And now I am one of those oblivious older people. And I thought, what would it take for somebody to actually reverse their lifetime and take that risk? So it's called unthinkable. Wow. Yeah. But it's wonderful that you can just kind of follow your muse, you know. You you oh. it's such an interesting career when you know you write what story comes to you. I'm so lucky. Mm. You know, Barbara, I am so lucky that I've never had a massive bestseller. That's what did for Hammett, the thin man did for Hammett. He wrote that same book over and over and over again. He didn't fulfill his last contract because it's so beguiling. And actually, I think I've had the best career because I, I can just do all these different things. Before lockdown, I'd done a breath play. Um, you know, I do radio plays. I do, I just, I just get to do loads and loads and loads of different things and really just following my nose and following my interests and I get to read all the time and listen to podcasts all the time and you know I'm just incredibly lucky I'm so grateful it's an interesting thought but I think it's true that having a success is intimidating um and and creates its own sort of set of strictures it's very hard to you know it's really hard to think about if you have some you know Gone Girl or Da Vinci Code or Silence of the Lambs or something I think it would be dreadfully hard to to sit down and write another book. And also, you, a lot of people are depending on you. It's not just about you on your own. The publishers are depending on you. You know, the publicists are depending on you. Bookshops are depending on you. Um, you know, I mean, I would think, especially for people when that happens very early in their career, yeah. I think it can really change the course of their life. No, I agree. I think I think if success a success like that, which is unpredictable, really, you know, comes along later, and everybody's better equipped to handle it. And it you know, yeah. it's, an, yeah. it's an interesting question. Not being creative myself, I don't really know what kind of effect, you know, having a wild success would have on one's creativity, whether it would be scary or whether it'd be inspiring. I really don't know. But mm -hmm. you know, I agree with you. You've had a wonderful career and. You know, it's so successful that you can do whatever you want, but it's not so successful that you are forced to think about all that. So, you know, you're in a very sweet spot, aren't you? 
Really sweet spot. Really sweet spot. I'm going to go on fire as soon as I hang up this uh, Zoom call. You know that. Something awful is going to happen. I feel like I'm bringing down a curse on myself, acknowledging well, how much I can step outside and immediately catch fires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Right. But anyway, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for agreeing to spend an hour with us. And as I understand it, you're doing some kind of a program on Thursday on Zoom with your publisher, but I can't remember what it is. Do you want to tell people in case it's, they need to join? It's crime and cocktails. So it's a cocktail hour and I'll be talking about Chandler and um, it, the link is on my Instagram and uh, Mulholland Books will be uh, instaing the link as well. They're going to give you a recipe for cocktails and we're going to talk Chandler. Wonderful. Well, it might be a different conversation, but you know, if you're <laughs> It certainly will be a different conversation. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this, then you might want to tune in and listen to Denise over drink, which has also been part of this conversation, although yeah. we're not drinking. Um, but anyway, um, it's such a treat. So I hope to see you again soon. I hope you might come and visit us next year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. let me again recommend a um, very short read, but really profound, practically life-changing, Three Fires says so much about the state of the world today and how we're all behaving and who's in charge. And then Patrick will tell you how much he loves the second murder, which I'm going down to the bookstore and retreat it's from. It's brilliant. So I can read a copy. Yeah, yay. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody, for watching and um, enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of your evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Denise.